good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, in two decades of uh, my television career, if there is one interaction I always look forward to is to interact with Mr. Piramal and understand very few simple things about risk, passion, and opportunity. The way Mr. Piramal has really connected these three things in his entrepreneurial journey, risk, opportunity, and passion, I think is quite extraordinary. I mean, he's got a range of experience from managing real estate to pharma, NBFC, lending. Uh, he pretty much understands the whole identification of entrepreneurship and what are the critical pillars for you know entrepreneurship. So, Mr. Paramal, I look forward to learn, understand, and all of us perhaps are looking to you know hear from you as to what your idea about uh, entrepreneurship is. But before I do that, sir, I, th I guess the world can be divided in two parts because of COVID, before COVID and after COVID, and post COVID, the world has changed. Especially for India, it has changed. The India, it has changed. The entrepreneurship engine is humming. India has arrived as the go-to destination. So in, to your mind, as an entrepreneur, and for India per se, post-COVID, what has been the biggest change? You know, I find that the biggest change post-COVID is really the positivity and the optimism that both people in India have and people outside India have. I mean, I meet uh, quite a few people, investors and other businessmen from all over the world, most of them now coming to India. And let me tell you that the only thing they talk about is how the growth prospects of India are. And in fact, I probe them that what do you think as risks? So there are very few risks. And this is the first time in my career, which is 45 years now, that there is so much of optimism from all over the world, whether it's bankers, whether it is investors, whether it's other businessmen. This has never happened before. And the reason why, there is a real reason for it. One is I think the way we managed COVID whether for the population, for the economy, has been exemplary. I don't think any other large country has done what we did. You know, there was a shock at the first time COVID was. When the second time COVID wave came in, again, there was a fear, ki kya ho hai? But I think the way we managed, whether it was the free food gain to 80 crore people, whether it was the direct benefit transfer of 2,000 rupees to each uh, who was below the poverty line or, or the economically backward. I think the way the economy was handled by the Ministry of Finance, by the RBI, the way the vaccination and so on, I don't want to keep repeating, but we all know that. So I think that has given us a much stronger base. Look at it today, I think it's the first time at least in 10, 20 years where you find that the inflation in India is lower than the inflation in the developed world, whether it's the US, whether it's the Eurozone, uh, UK. So that again is very different. The Indian rupee has been relative to all these currencies, whether it's the euro, whether it's the yen, whether it's the sterling, has been more is stronger than the dollar. So do you think India to do well both in absolute term and also in relative terms? It is doing well, yeah. Now, for entrepreneurship to flourish, Mr. Piramal, you need access to capital. That's the biggest impediment for a country like India. I mean, our economy ultimately is capital starved. We are dependent on global capital. How do you see that changing in environment when interest rates are normalizing? So, you know, I was hearing the previous uh, speakers, Mr. Agarwal and the others, as well as there is a lot of optimism in India, but I think, uh, and I don't want to repeat that because we all know it. I think let's talk a little bit about the concerns that we have. The only reason why I'm doing saying so is that we want to grow faster because this is the best time India has had. 
If you look at it, if India has to grow at 8% GDP, which is what our aspiration is, if you want to go to a 5 trillion and then 10 trillion, generally in real terms, if it's 8%, then when you want the availability, credit must grow at approximately 18 to 20%. For credit to grow 18 to 20%, it has never happened in India. And I don't think we have today, we do not have banking or the NBFCs or anybody who can grow it that much. So we are capital starved. And therefore, we have to work towards getting capital. There are many opportunities we can learn from what the rest of the world has done. So for instance, today, in India, banks or let's look at pension funds, provident funds, EP, uh, the ESIS, EPFO, all these are not allowed to invest in too many companies. With the regulations becoming tighter, better in India, I think we will have to open this, uh, these funds available. Today, 50% of all these funds go into government securities. I think they must be allowed to be invested into companies. The, the second thing I find is that we need to get not only how do you raise funds today. A company does either from banks or from you get uh, either you get public deposits or you can get bonds. Corporate bonds do not exist, so that's one area. Equity markets, we do not have enough equity options. Look at what happens in, let's say, other countries. Look at Canada. All their pension funds, whether it's CDPQ, whether it's CPPIB, we know all these funds, whether it's the GIC in Singapore, they are the ones who are using funds which are of the public and investing it in, in countries and getting a good return for their own uh, holders of the pensions. So I think we need to do that. The cost of capital in India is extremely high, and we are becoming very, very uncompetitive. And I don't think we can reach a 10% growth unless we open this up. Also, I don't know what the hesitation is to allow giving banking licenses to other to uh, private players. After the banking licenses, which were given several years ago, now two decades when, you know, you found the Kotak and the HDFC and all these in the sin. There's been no major bank that's come up. And we've seen these have been successful. So why not you give it more? And now the regulators in India are much, I mean, you know, they're much better there. So again, I feel that shortage of equity, shortage of debt is going to be our constraint. Uh, Mr. Parambal, one of the unique advantage of India is that our corporate balance sheet and the retail balance sheet and the government balance sheet is not leveraged. Unlike developed markets, when interest rates they go up and down, the leverage backfires. So at a time when the promise of credit growth is so good, should we start leveraging the economy? Because in a downturn, it will hit us because if you're foreign capital. So if you look at it, the average debt in India to GDP is only about 55% is the debt to GDP. In, in Asia, the figure is 150% is debt to equity. And always debt is much cheaper than equity. So we must allow more debt to come in. And that's why I'm saying open up the markets to debt. And why should individual savings be just left in you know, public deposits or left in unproductive assets. This is where we have to have opportunities. That is the fuel for growth. One uh, question, if I may throw in before I get into a whole, uh, you know, acquisition financing, is that what is your understanding of the current credit cycle? Because everybody would like to hear from you. You understand risks, sir, very well. Uh, if, where do you think this credit cycle is headed? Because we are already two years into this credit cycle of 15, 18%. Actually, the credit cycle has been benign for a long time. And I think in spite of COVID, you've seen that the credit cycle has been very benign. 
If you look at bank balance sheets today, the net NPA is at the lowest level. And there is, uh, across the board, I think, thanks to a lot of the data that's available, whether it's, you know, through all the digitization, the credit cycle has been good. Has, so there is a concern that people feel that it cannot go on forever. But, you know, I'm looking at it on a daily basis to see, are we getting any delinquencies or people are not paying up uh, on time? It's not showing yet. And I think it's not only in our case, but across the board. So we just keep our fingers crossed. I just hope that because of the, you know, all the crystal, the Sybil data, and all the other things, it should be in a better position. Uh, Mr. Paramal, what about acquisition funding? Acquisition financing? I mean, that's you know, I heard in the previous uh, this thing when uh, Mr. Agarwal was there, how he went uh, to the, uh, you know, he said that there are so many companies in NCLT and that we should take that opportunity to acquire them. I agree with him, but where is the funding? It is all right for larger corporations to get that funding, but today in India, acquisition funding is just not allowed. Banks are not allowed to give it. And I think we need to again open up because there are so many assets. So just like you give funding for a project, why can't you give it for an acquisition? Take the security of the assets, take the security of the cash flow. I think we have to open up, you know, these, some of these things have become archaic, our thinking that no acquisition financing was relevant at a time of, but today it is not. How will you encourage a new entrepreneur to get into business? And if it is acquisition, if you have an asset which is unproductive, you think you can acquire it and make it productive, you need funding. And if you don't do it, I think then only the bigger ones will do more and more acquisitions. And if you look at it, almost all the acquisitions in NCLT have been done by the larger companies. If you want to democratize business, I think we will have to open up this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasek is also in the hall, so let's put our hands together to welcome him. This is the next session which is coming up, so thank you very much, sir. Mr. Paramal, I know you've got a packed uh, you know, evening, so I'll extend my appointment. I'll take the liberty of extending by just two more questions. Uh, you heard two fintech managements, sir, just before the panel. We had two fintech managements. Uh, I would call them fintech because one is in broking, second is a genuine fintech. How do you see the fintech space versus the traditional NBFC business moving? I think uh, it's very difficult to separate the two. You cannot say that a traditional NBFC does not have fintech. The only thing in fintech, and especially now with all the regulations that the RBI is coming with, they have to have a balance sheet. If they have a balance sheet which backs the technology, then it's, uh, it, is what it, it is a lending business, just like an NBFC. Uh, or traditional NBFC in your terms. I mean, we have probably 250 people who are just doing technology. So it is, I don't see any distinction because that distinction cannot last. It's not going to, those who do not embrace technology on one hand will not survive. At the same time, fintechs, if they don't have a balance sheet, they will not survive. Now my last question, ladies and gentlemen, I've been wanting to ask this to Mr. Paramal for, for almost 10 years now. I'm glad I'm getting this opportunity today. And it's not a tough question, so no googlies from me. My simple question is, if Ajay Paramal of 2023 meets, Sorry? if Ajay Paramal of 2023 meets Ajay Paramal 40 years ago when he started his entrepreneurship journey, and if you have to give an advice to Ajay Paramal of 40 years ago, what advice would you give? I would, I think it's just, I would just say that if 40 years ago, today the opportunities are huge, which actually are there every time. I think an entrepreneur has to be one who can sp spot an opportunity when others don't think there's op opportunity. That's the thing. So whether it is then or now, it doesn't matter. So is Ajay Paramal excited, cautiously bullish, a term which every corporate uses these days? or he is outright bullish about India's growth in the next five years. The minister is here, sir, now. 
I, you know, these are things, I can say anything for public audience to make it sound good, but yeah, we are bullish. I mean, there's obviously, it is bullish, but one has to always have risk in mind. You can't be just bullish without, you can't be a bull in the China shop. <laughs> I started by saying that this man understands risk more than anybody else. We started the discussion with risk and we're ending the discussion on risk. But really appreciate your time, Mr. Paramal. Thank you so very much. And as promised, we're not keeping you back from your next meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Piramal, and thank you, Nikunj, as well. The central government's pivotal initiative, ladies.